you could argue the end of wisdom. Not the cessation of wisdom, but the culmination of wisdom. Two very different things. Here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the whole of the book of Ecclesiastes has primarily been focused, as we've noticed, on earthly wisdom. And we've dealt with a lot of aspects of earthly wisdom. That is the, the culmination of doing things wisely in this world and how it can pay dividends uh, under the sun. And how even in the best of times, you have situations like in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Notice in verse 6, he says, Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the fisher shattered at the fountain. All references to death. And he says, Or the wheel broken at the well. Oh, that one. Seven, he says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. We here in this world, folks do a lot of things to try to lengthen the days that they have on this earth. And we talk about wisdom, and they would say, well, certain things in this world are not wise because it shortens your lifespan. And, and there's a relative concept there. Smoking. They talk about the number of days or years every cigarette takes off of your life. And uh, drinking alcohol. Many things uh, they call vices even in this world, which I think is ironic. Uh, they're wise enough to make decisions like that, to understand that things are dangerous or harmful to your body. But then they miss the end goal of this entire life. He says, of all of these things, of all the things that I've talked about, the fact that we will return to the dust with which we were made means that everything under the sun is inevitably vanity. And so you have people out in the world who are incredibly smart. And they make wise decisions under the sun. They invest in, in uh, incredible opportunities. They can see the end of a situation playing out. They're even good, you know, dealing with leaders of the world. And they can help, you know, stabilize companies or corporations or entire economies, but in the end, if they are not a child of God, it does not matter. It was all in vanity, because they will find the condemnation that all individuals who are not children of God, who are not innocent, made innocent in the blood of Christ, or innocent altogether anyway, they're all going to find. And so as he's talking about wisdom, and he's spent the better part of 11 chapters talking about earthly wisdom and how people try to elongate their life and do these things, he comes to the conclusion that it ultimately does not matter if one thing is missing. <clears throat> Which I would argue, even if you make the poorest decisions in this life under the sun, but you're right with God, you've made the best decision. You're the wisest of individuals because you have picked the long game, you might argue. You have picked the right thing to be right in. In verse 9 he says, and moreover, which means he's bringing ahead to all of the things that are going on here. He's bringing culmination of all the ideas that he's brought forward in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Solomon begins to give his credentials, you might say, here in verse 9. Because the preacher was wise. He says he, he talks about his wisdom. And we recognize that Solomon's wisdom was God-given. In first or in Second Chronicles chapter 1, we talked about this before. In verse 7, God asks him, he says, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon could have asked for anything. He was becoming king of the Israelites. And he had watched his father, David, lead the people. And he had watched... He had heard, I'm sure, about the previous king of Israel, Saul, who had done so unwisely. And he asks, he says, Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this great people of yours? Now I'm not sure if that's like a backhanded compliment to the people or not. Who can lead the people that belong to you? These people, they don't listen very well, perhaps he's saying. He would be right if that's what he's talking about. Who can judge this great people of yours? But he asks for wisdom and knowledge. He says, I'm going to do my best, and what I need is help. I need knowledge and wisdom from you. And he could have asked, as we notice here, God recognizes, because this was in your heart, he says, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge of yours for yourself. 
that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Solomon, he says, you made the right choice. You made a choice that goes beyond human wisdom. So I reckon he had a fair amount of wisdom to begin with. The fact that he was able to distinguish and understand what was truly important as a king. And it's never been your fame or your fortune, the amount of money that you have or the riches that are in your bank. It's never been about the power of your armies or how many enemies you even have. It's always been about how to lead well God's people, recognizing where the emphasis needs to be. And so he says, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. He says, yeah, I'll give you that. I'll give you wisdom and knowledge, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. But notice it doesn't end there. We notice in the book of Ecclesiastes, even after he received such wisdom, what did Solomon do? But he went on adventures, and he tried to find purpose and meaning in life, and while you would argue he ultimately failed, did he really? He didn't find anything worthwhile, anything meaningful, anything eternal in any of the aspects of human, of human concepts, of what we create under the sun. He found nothing. And you would say, well, he didn't find meaning and purpose under the sun, so he failed. No. No, in fact, because he culminates here and in this previous passage in, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 12. The only place you're going to find wisdom, and I've experienced this firsthand, he says. My credentials are solid. God gave me wisdom, and then I sought out more wisdom. And I exercised this wisdom, and I experienced life in the whole book of Ecclesiastes, and I came to the conclusion that I'm going to end with. And so he begins communicating to the people, and notice he seeks out, and he sets in order many proverbs. It wasn't just enough for him to be wise independently. Even as a king, he would make many decisions. He would decide whether they went to war or what they planted in certain areas. He would decide, uh, well, in Solomon's case, he would decide to build many structures. And he would design quite a few of those structures personally. And so there was much wisdom involved in planning out how things would be done and a lot of decisions that needed to be made. And yet, what does he spend his time doing in verse 9, it says? Trying to figure out how to communicate this wisdom, how to share it. Because the wisest of things, and this is another important thing for us to notice, the wisest of things that we can possibly do is share the wisdom that we have gained. Because there is coming a day that the wisdom that we have gained and possess currently, whatever we have garnered from the world or our experiences, there's one day that it's not going to make any difference to us any longer. And the best thing that we can do is share it. And so I have sat at the feet of some incredibly wise individuals, not because they had been blessed with earthly wisdom by God, but because they had experienced many things. They had been through the things that I had been through. They had experienced much of this life, and they had many things that they could impart to me. Wise sayings, proverbs, you might even say. And there were things that I learned because of it. And there are things that we all can learn by reading the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Because Solomon didn't just, he wasn't just satisfied with having all the wisdom in the world and having many answers to many questions. He was also concerned with sharing that. And of all the things, minus the conclusion that he comes to, that may be the wisest decision he ever made. I am mindful of what John says about Jesus' life in John chapter 21. And, well, the end of chapter 20, and then the end of chapter 21 as well. He says that, that many other things Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. And in 21 he would say that, that if they were filled in all the books, if they were written down, every one of them, they'd fill the whole world. But he says, the point was that I wrote these things down that you may believe, and that believing you may have life in his name. And Solomon, it seems, would conclude the same thing. I want you to get one thing from all that I wrote. And I want you to know I failed miserably in all of these avenues. I failed in every capacity under the sun to find meaning. Which is why I'm culminating here in verse 12 with where you're going to find meaning. What truly is wise? 
and how to live a wise life even while you're in this world. And so he tries to communicate, and he says, Guys, learn from my experience. Notice verse 10, he says, The preacher sought to find acceptable words. That is not an easy thing to do. If you've ever tried to communicate, and I'm sure you have, communicate some important thing to a child. Communicate some important thing to someone who has absolutely no understanding of the topic at all. It's not an easy thing to do. Religiously, culturally, historically, it doesn't matter. It's not an easy thing to do. And so he sought to find acceptable words, words that would fit to the meanings that he was trying to convey. And what was written was upright, words of truth, he says. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Who's that one shepherd? Or where did, his, where did his wisdom come from? But from God. He says that these words that I can record, that I can share, that I can distribute, they are like well-driven nails. When I was a kid, we, we built a deck. And I've told you some of the story in this deck because it's got a lot of stories in it because it took us a while. But we used these spikes, these spiral-cut spikes. And they were nails, so you drive them in. But they twisted all along, almost like a screw, only, only less, uh, less condensed. And when you're driving the nail, if it goes crooked, you're done. You just got to pull the dumb thing out, throw it away, and get another one. But they were really long. And the reason they were cut with a spiral in them was so that they would have a hard time coming back out. And you know that deck is still there. And it may be there for, if they take care of it and they take care of the wood itself, that, that deck may stay together until the Lord returns. I don't know. Depends on when that is, but it could be there for a long time. There's something satisfying with that, with that last hit of the hammer on the nail when it goes in and it sinks to the depth it's supposed to be at. And then there's almost a finality, a certainty when you finish something like that, maybe the last nail even. It just feels good. It feels like it's supposed to be there. And he says, wise words are that way. When they are shared, when you communicate something that is wise in a way that other people can understand, you can tell you have effectively changed their world. Maybe the way they look at things. And maybe it's not a big thing. But it's certainly with wisdom an important thing. He says in verse 12, And further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Every student alive knows this. No. I grew up in a town that had an extreme library. It was insane. Like, we, Trisha, it's not in your head. We would go in, and you could... You could delve deep in that library. You could get lost in that library. It was insane how many books were there and how many topics were covered. And we would do research projects, and a few of us knew how to manage the library and how to use the library effectively. And even then, you would find dozens upon dozens of books that would be perfectly fitted for your topic. And how do you pick which one? Because all of them are going to tell you something not just that's different, but some different aspect of the same concept or the same topic. And you could spend your entire life and you'd never get through that library, reading everything. And that's just one library out of theoretically millions of libraries. I can't imagine when the city of Alexandria was, or the, the, the library of Alexandria was, uh, was unearthed or, uh, or they were trying to restore it. Or, uh, I read an article about that recently they're trying to kind of restore some of the scrolls and whatnot. And to think about all of the knowledge that was gathered there, that was collected, and how long it would take a human being to go through, even if they were speed readers. And Solomon says, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Books are nice, and they can be reference material, and they can do a lot of things. But there's always going to be more things that you can learn. There's always going to be new topics that you're going to discover and wonder about. And he's saying you've got to prioritize things. 
you have to be willing to put what is most important out front and pursue it. And he's going to get to that in a second. Because he says there in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. You're probably very familiar with this passage. Specifically verse 13, I find fewer people are familiar with verse 14. They go very well together though. So he says, learn from my experiences, and more precisely, don't learn the hard way. If you can learn from someone else not to do a certain thing, you should learn that. Rather than learning it on your own and having to go through the pain or the struggle or the loss that's going to happen when you do so. There were a lot of things that my father tried to impart in me, and some of them stuck. And sometimes I do something, and then I go, that's why my dad told me not to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. One thing you don't learn the hard way, I think, is not to try too hard to break a bolt in a car. That is to say, you got a bolt that's stuck. It's really tight, and you're tempted to just muscle through it. Don't. Learn the easy way from my experiences, because what's going to happen is either the bolt is going to give, or your, your wrench is going to give, and then your knuckles are going to give way to whatever sharp thing is in there. And you're just going to skin your hand. It's going to be awful. So I might have only a little wisdom, but I will impart it when I can. <laughs> Solomon's conclusion is incredible here in verse 13. He says, let us consider the conclusion of the whole matter. And when he says the whole matter, I almost assume he means everything. You know, we, we kind of restrict it to Ecclesiastes, and that's our... That's still a lot of stuff. Or we, we conclude he's talking about his life. Fair enough. But Solomon could be talking about everything in the world, and he would still be right. He says the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. In verse 14 he says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says, the conclusion of the matter happens to come into two things. And this is very symmetric, the way the New Testament writers use these two things as well, oftentimes. Fear God, he says. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, he says, excuse me, Peter when confronted with these Gentiles who were able to work miracles just as they had, the apostles, back in the days of the Pentecost, he concludes, when he sees this with the seven, the six other men, there were seven of them, so six other men, he concludes, he says, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And the word here for fear is a very similar word to the word we use for when people are afraid in our culture. Um, the idea of, of phobia. Uh, afraid of things. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the word in Greek and in Hebrew. And a lot of people try to narrow it down almost or bring it down on it, the level of the word. But when he says fear, he doesn't really mean fear like we're supposed to be scared. I would say that's not necessarily true in how the word is used. Specifically, like, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, I'm getting these out of order, that's fine. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, he means terror, because he says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear the one who can destroy you utterly. Yeah, terror. And there are quite a few other uses of this concept. Does it always mean that? No, obviously not. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, when Joseph is trying to figure out what to do with his betrothed, he doesn't want to put her away publicly, but he also doesn't want this situation laid at his feet. He says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife, for... That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Was he terrified? No, he was concerned. Could you argue that on the way we use fear in our culture, was he fearful of the recompense of what would happen if this got out? Maybe. But not fear like you're afraid of 
hellfire and brimstone, and you should be if you're not. We should be afraid of the judgment of God. Terror. And we should be concerned. So what's he saying? Well, it's a mix of both. The terror that we have in relation to judgment should help us be concerned about our future. It should help us have perspective and how we look at things. When we talk about God, the way we deal with God should be changed or modified because of the power of God. And we focus oftentimes on the mercy and the loving kindness, and those are incredible aspects of God's character. But the fact that hell exists and human beings go there should put fear in us. We should respect God, and it should come out in the way we act in this life. But too often, people have relegated God to a friend, a best friend, perhaps, someone they can manipulate, someone they can push with their emotional instability. You can't push God off of his position. You can't get him to deviate from his path. That's not how God works. And so he says, fear God. And one way that we fear God, we respect him, is to keep his commandments. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. I don't know how much plainer we can get. People will be like, I love God. Will he keep his commandments? Well, some of them. Then you don't love God. Jesus said that himself. If you're going to say you are committed to him, you must continue in his will. In verse 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. How many times we can say this without people getting it? And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Well, I mean well. Don't we all? Well, I really wish things were different. Sure. But they're not. This is what the Word of God says. This is what God has communicated to us. If we are unwilling to do it, then we prove not only do we not love God, we don't fear him either. If you walk up to a gate... And you hear a loud, barking, angry dog on the other side, you don't go through it. Especially if it says, beware of dog. Beware of big, angry, scary dog. You can say that to you. You don't go through it. And you know how you prove you're afraid of that dog? By not going through the gate. But are we really fearful of our future? Does it change and modify how we act and how we live? Are we willing to keep his commandments to prove that we are his, that we love him, and that we are willing to give ourselves fully to him? And then in 14 he says why this is the conclusion of the whole matter, why this is all that matters. This is all that matters, and here's why he says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 12, he says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the vision of soul and spirit, of joints and morrows, is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, if we stop there, there's a lot of things we hide from one another. There's emotions that we hide. There are thoughts that we'd rather not share openly with everybody. Because they might not be who we really are, we're not going to make a decision off that. Sometimes when something bad happens, something negative enters our mind, and we don't share it immediately. And we don't talk about it because it was there and we put it where it, where it belonged, maybe. But you know who does know that you had that thought? God. You can't hide from God. You can't go into your secret place. You can't make sure the lights are turned off before you commit sin or you're involved in something you ought not. It's not a matter of whether the moon is out that allows for sin to be overlooked. Even in the darkest night, in the most desperate of events, God knows. He knows, and we will be held accountable for our actions, even 
every secret thing that is in us, whether good or evil, which also means you can't hide your good works from them either. We might hide our good works from others, and people might never know that we did something good for somebody else. Good, because you know who does? God. See, it really depends on your perspective, because it goes both ways, does it not? And we oftentimes focus on the negative. Like, when Hagar runs off from Sarah because she has been <laughs> yelled at, effectively, Sarah's going to, to disin <laughs> disinherit them and, and get rid of Hagar and Ishmael because she's angry that this didn't work out the way she thought it should. And Hagar runs, and then God stops her. And what does she call that place? The place where God sees. And contextually, it's the place where God sees me. The place where God knows me. And it's tempting for us to look negatively at that and say, well, the Lord, the Lord stopped me here, and he knows all the bad things. But he also knows all the good things. He knows that Hagar is a good servant. And while there may have been a misconception, it wasn't her idea to get involved in this nonsense. She was thrust into a situation that was not her own. It was a bad situation. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So we should fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. This is the whole duty of man. This is all that we have in this world that matters. There are a lot of stuff in this world. There's a lot of things that we can do, a lot of wisdom that we can bring out of ourselves and share, potentially. But there is no more wise thing than a relationship with God. There is no more wise thing. It doesn't matter if you make billions of dollars with your wisdom. It doesn't matter if you help millions of people with your wisdom, physically. If you are not a child of God, you are making the worst decision ever. You are proving ultimately that you are unwise. Because you haven't gotten that core function of humanity down. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And that is the end of wisdom. Not the cessation of wisdom, but the culmination of wisdom. From the wisest man ever. From the wisest man whom God made wise, and he still pursued wisdom. He still found more out about life and concluded things that possibly only he could have concluded. He continued to search and to scribe and to help, and he gave us a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding, a lot of help in our weakness and in our frailty. But the most important lesson that Solomon attempted to give us, and the one that we need to get from this whole study, if you get nothing else, maybe if you get nothing else in 10 or 12 or 15 years, if you can get this, then you're in business. Fear God. Keep his commandments. And if we do that, we're already moving in the right direction. We've become some of the wisest individuals in the world. Because our eternity is at stake. If you need to put Christ on in baptism, if you need to follow his will because you fear, you respect, but you are also terrified. Terrified of a life without God, an eternity without God. Separated from him, the condemnation that comes from not being his. You can change that tonight. You can become a child of God. You can become a wise individual. And it doesn't matter what nonsense you've been involved in. It doesn't matter what kind of bad decisions you've made. Because if you make this good decision and you continue faithfully in his will, none of the rest matters. And you're going to continue making mistakes. And there are going to be problems in your life. But if you put Christ first... You show your wisdom because you put first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you, Matthew chapter 6. There is a wisdom in this world that folks do not understand. That the world will not grasp. But you have the opportunity to do so tonight. To become a child of God or to come back to Him or to help, ask, seek His body for help to stay right with God. It will be the best choice you ever make. If we can help you make it, if we can help you through it, whatever we can do for you, let us know. Let us together we stand and see.